Welcome to Control Your Narrative Weekly, episode one. The first episode. First episode. This is the first episode of Control Your Narrative Weekly. This will be an audio and visual introspective into everything the narrative provides from our talent, from our creative process, from what's happening in the world. Culture, sports, entertainment, sports and entertainment, Mm -hmm. socioeconomics, paragraphum theorems, I said that wrong, Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I am the narrator, JC Koshesky, and I'm here with the essential character, EC3. Hello. Um, we're gonna be, every episode's gonna be a little bit of a introduction, us hanging out, what's going on in the world of narrative, and then we're gonna have some real in-deep therapy sessions with those who have fought within the narrative. And those who have contributed to it. And those, therefore, when we run out of these people, people who are learning to control their narrative. Mm -hmm. Control your narrative is to tell your story and with free the narrative with what we bring, we want people to be able to tell their stories, their reality, and it starts with the performers in the ring. Performers that you will never get the opportunity to see their true creativity, their true essence, their true humanity come out because for the most part they are controlled in some aspect by somebody else and that's Mm -hmm. part of the gig. We understand that, that is the deal, but as we continually try to reprogram wrestling, not only from uh, the corporate standard and perhaps even the fan standards, we're going to be trying things different. We're gonna do Mm -hmm. things out there. We're going to bring you as much reality as we can because we open each narrative feature with what? This is our reality. This is our reality. And today we bring you the reality of Adam Scher, AKA the former Braun Strowman, AKA the Titan. So with Free the Narrative, a lot of things fell into place. Excuse me, Free the Narrative 2. A lot of things had to fall into place to make this happen. We were just coming off production of the first one when Adam's WWE release came through. And even the day before, we were discussing what he would do if he was ever had a chance to be in the narrative. And it was pretty happenstantial, almost serendipitous conversation we had as we were filming something for another means, but uh, the chips, fell where they did, the stars have aligned, and the very first thing he wanted to do as he forayed outside of the corporate wrestling umbrella was be a part of the narrative. Yeah, and you've said it a few times, he could have walked out on any three-letter brand to the biggest pop. Easy. And fell into mediocrity. (laughs) You don't fall into mediocrity as much as once the initial uh, luster wears off of someone somewhere new, wow, this is awesome everything falls into place and then becomes status quo. And one thing about telling stories that have consequence and are uh, real, emotional, have moments, is that uh, you don't have that opportunity sometimes because there's so many other factors at play, whether it's a blessing or a curse. The blessing is, this is a lot of people's dreams Mm -hmm. to wrestle for television. But the curse is sometimes that with that comes, you have to give part of yourself to do it. And uh, we all accept that. Mm-hmm. We do it. I do it all the time. And, but I also took it upon myself to create something new. So uh, we sat down with Adam about a week ago uh, and filmed a very, uh, very personal uh, therapy session. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to take it on over to uh, yourself. To myself interviewing uh, Adam Shear, free Adam Shear. Adam, you're free. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's an understatement, honestly. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's uh, it's scary still. I'm not gonna lie. You know, uh, kind of put all my eggs in one basket there for a, quite a long time, and uh, the basket got. Thrown away. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's uh, let's take it. Let's take it to the the night before uh, you got released. Uh, we were here filming with you um, for some some Hollywood opportunities. Yeah, that was for uh, audition read for Maggie Moore's. I'm still waiting to hear if I got that part <laughs> or not. Hopefully. And you know, uh, the all, you had all the excitement about the narrative, uh, just seeing it, and all the creative juices flowing. And Let me stop you right there yeah. about excitement. Like, yeah. I had an unbelievable career in wrestling. In the short amount of time that I did it, like, let's be for real, I never stepped foot into a wrestling ring my entire life. I stepped into a ring uh, July of 2013, 
September 2015, I debuted on Monday Night Raw the night after SummerSlam in the Barclays Center, Brooklyn, New York, and I had five matches under my belt. Twelve matches into my wrestling career, I'm wrestling with the late, great Brody Lee um, in Merida, Mexico versus the Brothers of Destruction. And for the people that aren't, don't know wrestling, that's The Undertaker and Kane. Mm -hmm. Um, in front of, it just did it to <laughs> yeah. me too, uh, in front of like 15,000 people at a sold out arena. And yeah, I mean, from that to winning Money in the Bank, to winning the Greatest Royal Rumble, to winning the Andre the Giant Battle Memorial Royale, um, to winning the Intercontinental Championship, to winning the Raw Tag Team Championships, to winning the Universal Championship, to do all that in like five years. One is still like trying to soak that in, but <laughs> you know, uh, being involved and thrown into the deep end in this industry, you know, coming from the outside world, you know, I caught a lot of flack from it for sure, but uh, I fell in love with the art that is professional wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I've watched a lot of wrestling a lot of good wrestling, a lot of bad wrestling, a lot of storytelling, cinematic stuff, you name it, I've watched it. And when you guys release the first narrative, it's one if not the only time in my entire life for an hour and a half, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. If there was something to it, the storytelling, the way you guys edit it, everything came together in like a really unbelievable work of art. And it, it opened my eyes to some of the things that are more important in life, I think, you know, and it's seeing you guys having fun, being creative, telling your story, controlling your narrative, as cliche as it is in all of this right now, it really is, and to see and know and be around you guys and the, the stuff that we've done behind the scenes and <clears throat> allotted the friendship that's come out of this, watching that and making me realize like, man, that's so much fun. And don't get me wrong, I had an unbelievable time with WWE and stuff like that, but it was like, man, this is something cool. This is something different. And how ridiculous was, was it? We're talking about all this. I'm putting over how awesome I thought what you guys have done was and joking about the day that I get fired, <laughs> how this is what I want to do. Yeah, because we were already saying like, maybe start filming a documentary that we can release by the time you're released. Uh, and then the universe gave us yeah, it gave, 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 gave it. We spoke into existence. I it spoke happened. it into existence. Maybe it's my fault. <laughs> but no, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. You know, I have no hard feelings at all. Man, everything that WWE allotted me in life. And no, it was ups and downs and hard times, good times, bad times, fun. I mean, fun, so much fun. I'm so ever indebted to that company and to Vince McMahon and stuff like that because he gave me a shot at life that I could have never imagined. He gave me an opportunity to meet you guys. Yeah. I would never have met you guys if I didn't get involved in this business. I would have never been able to travel the world, see the things that I've done, meet the people that I've done, fall in love with people that I met through this business. And it's something special and I'm so unbelievably humble for the experiences that I was able to experience with WWE. Did it end how I wanted it to? Of course not. And I know people are always, I've been hearing it a ton. Well, you said you'd never wrestle again when you were done with WWE. Well, I was forced to be done. I never, I said I would never wrestle for another company when I took my boots off for WWE. Mm -hmm. I never took my boots off. I never had an opportunity to put them back on to come back to work. And it, I ain't gonna lie, it sent me into a pretty bad place. You guys saw how I yeah, was. Yeah, this, this was an interesting summer, uh, a pre-production process and going into this. Um, you know, and anybody has, has, has watched the uh, Free the Narrative 2, um, that was pretty much this whole summer you were going through that. And he, Adam, you just went into this, you, you really went to the lowest point so you can see who is actually still looking down at you. And, and you know, that and it, it's And, and it's, it's a hard thing, you know, uh, to realize like the wrestling business is very cutthroat. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fair weather friends that came and, and, and went through all this whole process. You know, people that were all oh, praising you, lifting you up when you're on top of the mountain, but when the mountain crumbles beneath your feet, they're standing there kicking dirt on top of you to continue to bury you. So it's one of those hard reality pills that you had to swallow, that I had to swallow and stuff like that. Seeing, seeing literally my life's work slip through my fingertips. Um, because I always said, like, 
I felt like God put me on this earth to be a WWE superstar. And for a while he did. But in the realization of hitting what my rock bottom was, it realized that I was put on this earth to do more than that. I was put on this earth to inspire people. And what you guys have allotted me to do in, in the Free the Narrative 2 is to not only fix myself and what was going on with me and my depression and my anger and my rage for things in my life that I couldn't control. You gave me a platform and a place to be able to control me, mm -hmm. to be able to, to tear myself down, to be vulnerable. Like the narrative, the narrative was hard for me. Um, I, a lot of it I don't remember what happened what was going on because I was so caught up in the moment. I was so emotionally distraught and it was such a relieving, it was therapy. Yeah. Like it was. Oh, we're 100% we're therapists. Yeah, it this was, is. It was a life changing thing for me to be able to let it out, to be vulnerable in front of people that I'd never met before in my life. And, and then being able to hopefully, millions of people are going to see this, to see the man that is behind the monster yeah. and you know uh i mean there's moments in there uh where you're, you're laying down and i mean we we edited it shorter but it went on for a little while when we were actually filming it and i'm just seeing you in this moment and like and you sat in it and you didn't walk away from it you stayed brave you stayed you looked it right in the eyes um we're done filming uh your stuff and you're outside and uh ec3 grabs me and says hey adam just laid it all gave it all to us and i go outside and I'm hugging you. And one of those things where I didn't realize it because uh, you give a good performance at WrestleMania, who's the first person to hug you in Gorilla? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I was, I'm a completely different person than Vince, but I'm holding you as, as, the, as the producer, holding you and, go, and you're just letting it all in. I, w I wish we could have filmed that, but it was, it was our moment. And it was, it was you, me, Quinton, and, and Belle, your dog. And it was like, I, like, I, felt, I felt like, I didn't feel like we were uh, making a wrestling show. I felt like family. It's 100%. Yes. I mean, that's, yeah. you guys are, you know, uh, what's the saying? You know, family isn't defined by having the same blood or having the same DNA. It's, uh, it's defined by the love that you share with people. And it's just from day one meeting you guys from the business ventures we've tried to do that have yeah. failed. <laughs> And you know, everything's not successful. I like yeah. to think that whatever I touch turns to gold, but that's just me being a narcissist. You know, everybody, everybody that's in entertainment has a little bit of it in them. But uh, no, yeah, it was such an experience of just, and, and, and even talking with, with Mike and stuff like that afterwards and watching it back, same thing with him. We were both so caught up in the moment. We were letting everything out, so much emotion that we didn't even realize what we were saying, what we were doing. We were just in the moment. And it was so cool to be able to capture this. And I was so excited watching the product of what we were able to do. And it's just, I can't express how much everyone worked so unbelievably hard at this. It was a rat race of a production. I mean, with little budget. Yeah, it was, it was pretty much like uh, we had 90 days to come up. But like it was, it was 90 days just to come up with it all. And then it was... We spent the whole last month putting it together and stuff and still trying to keep all our businesses and ventures exactly. and appearances strong and stuff. Uh, but yeah, everybody uh, threw down on this. Big shout out to uh, Tommy Tanks who made your theme song. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Goosebumps every time, uh, yeah. every time I hear it. And that was, uh, that was a, an approach of, uh, you know, there is the, uh, the, the Slipknots out there and the Code Oranges out there that, and Code Orange did a really great job with uh, the Fiends theme song, Bray Wyatt's theme song. And to be able to do that with you, because you, you didn't have anything to do with the Braun Strowman theme song, right? Other than the, the, the obnoxious scream at the beginning <laughs> of it. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but that's one of those songs st still, when I would hear it, especially in an arena, I felt like I was at a metal show. Like it was still like, it, it felt like a weight in your face, yeah. Uh, so the, to still have that, but then create something that, that actually sounds like a titan walking over the minions of the world. You know what I mean? I picture, you, when I hear that and I picture you, I picture people this big and you're, you know, you got Godzilla. Because <laughs> when I walked through the curtain, be it when I was Braun Strowman or now Adam Scher, the Titan moving forward, that's how I feel. That's how I felt when I competed in World's Strongest Man. And, and I'll give you guys a little background on that. Not a, a lot of people know, but not everybody that's going to watch this knows about it. Um, I'm the fastest American to ever start strongman competitions and turn professional in it. Um, I started and turned pro in 18 months. I won every competition except maybe four four, I think, as an amateur. 
2011, I was North America's Strongest Man. 2012, I won an Arnold Amateur World Championship where I defeated 59 guys from 19 different countries. I turned pro. I represented the United States in USA versus Canada. Finished fourth in my first pro show. Traveled to Poland to represent the United States in Giants Live. Finished sixth, I believe, in my second pro show. Then was in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, what was it? September-ish, I believe, 2012, as an alternate for World Strongest Man, and I did all this. This is all in less than three years. Um, yeah, because that's what we when we first met. You always say that. No, it says that Braun Strowman paid his dues, but I paid my dues. Like you a, paid him in a different, different world. way. I, I you, you tore every muscle. You, you still had all the same injuries. I, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what I mean. Uh, you, a lot of you have never seen me on my days off and stuff like that. Uh, I'm constantly in pain, and. Uh, there's times, there was many times, when, even in my WWE career, I, I was like a month away from quitting when I was in developmental because I didn't know if I could take it anymore. I had had so many injuries and had literally like life-changing injuries. Um, 2015, January 2015, I ruptured my L5-S1 disc in my back and it cut my sciatic nerve and completely paralyzed my left leg. And I had like a 65% chance of like getting it back and mm. I got 85% of my leg use back and that's why I am very very fucking sensitive <laughs> when people talk crap about my legs being small I can't help it yeah. you know um, it, that's one of them things that always gets on my nerves and it's just I can't help it and it's a physical disability that I have and it's 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 a hard one for me to deal with not only because just the people berating me and belittling me of it but it's because at one point I had some of the strongest legs on this earth I squatted over 900 pounds I deadlifted over a thousand pounds so it's it, it hurts to hear that and stuff like that but it's just you know it's those things that happen in life and you know I get that I saying everything happens for a reason and I don't know what the reason is for that other than for me to be able to tell this story and show people that you can overcome anything if you're willing to work and put your mind in it and put a little trust in the the guy that looks over us upstairs, you know. Um. Let's talk a little bit about that. Like, you, uh, you've you been talking to us a lot, and I mean, on social media, about going more into mental health uh, advocate to become, to, to start helping people through it. And I think the narrative uh, is a good launching pad for that. 100%. And I think you, you found that in there. Um, you know, uh, when you were doing, like, would you compare that to your make-a-wishes that you were doing with WWE, or do you or uh, take a completely man, different route? Like, how how would you approach that? I think the make-a-wishes are a little different. Okay. Those were, yeah, those were life-changing not only for the children that I got to meet and stuff like that, but for me, I'll never forget my first one and stuff like that. And it's just all of them. I mean, I used to get mad at our media teams because they were always sticking a damn camera in my face afterwards, and it's. When you're in there with the kids and stuff like that, you have to be the superhero. That they, when you're in there with the kids, you have to be the superhero that you portray on TV because they're leaning on you for strength. I had so many the parents crying, hugging me, telling me thank you and how much it means. One, that, that I'm taking the time out to, to meet their children, but they tell me stories of their kids listening to my theme music mm. on their way to the hospital, have brain surgery, holding my, oh man, I'm gonna, hang on. Uh, <clears throat> holding my action figures while they're being put under for anesthesia to have surgeries and treatments and chemotherapy and stuff. And you have to swallow those emotions and be strong in front of these kids because that's what gets them through their lives. And then I would come out, and every time I was an absolute wreck, I would have to walk off and be by myself because I'm a very emotional person. Like a lot of people don't know. Like he, when he you meet kids out in public, you start crying and stuff. Like, like I think the one thing that gets you the most is is being that superhero for kids. I think that is the, the biggest. It, it, and it is, and that's in, in all honesty, that's the one thing that I, that the only thing I'll say that I'm mad about my career ending with WWE. Um, was that being taken away from the kids? Yeah. Um, the money, yeah, don't get me wrong, it's great. It, it's given me life, things in life that I could have never imagined. The fame, I could absolutely 100% do without. Yeah. Other than the fact, the fame to those kids. Um, I've always been a sucker, I had a soft spot for children. It's just, that's the future and they're, they're so pressured, they should be so protected. 
and I felt like I had an opportunity, but not felt like I did. I still have an opportunity to help and inspire and, and mm -hmm. show these kids, like b kids that were bullied. I was bullied severely as a child for being a little fat kid and, and having s speech disabilities, reading disabilities and stuff. And you know, all that stuff is so near and dear to me and that's really cool now being able to think about these things that have happened in my past and use them to fuel positivity in my life and to be able to spread that positivity around other people. I'm really, really excited that I'm, I'm partnered up with John Paul DeGirio, one of the founders of um, Paul Mitchell Hair Products and the founder of Patron Spirits. Um, he owns a marketing company called Rocket and we have an app coming out called Discuss. And it's a really it's a this. it's yeah. a mental health app that gives you licensed professionals in the palm of your hand for when you're having a bad day or you're on that edge and you you don't have anybody to talk to. You can get on here. You can FaceTime with people. You can call. You can text messages and have someone to talk to. And that's what the biggest thing is. That there's such a stigma, I think, around mental health that people don't want to talk about it, especially people that look like me and have the life that I've lived and done the things that I do, I think it means even more being able to open up and talk about stuff like this because I'm not doing it for me. Like I don't do this stuff for me. Like if I was doing stuff for me, it would be selfish and me, me, me. I do this to try and help other people, to try and show people what life's really about. And, and, and it's such a thing that's the turn into my mantra is just, my life, my rules. You get one shot at this. You get one shot at, at life. And you know, so many people get caught up in worrying about how much money they make, how many followers they have on their social media platforms, this, this, and this, when they lose sight of what's really, really important. And that's being a good person. It's not hard to be a good person. It's easier to be a good person than it is to be bad. I feel yeah. like when I'm nasty or angry, like I Only have to go problems. out of my way yeah. to do that. Like I think in human nature, everyone's nice. That's what. That's why we live in communities. That's why we live in cities. That's why we're we're group people. We're herd animals, I guess yeah. per se. But we're not animals. The difference between us and animals is like well, most of us is. When someone's having trouble, we help each other instead of eating them. I mean, there's unfortunate, there's humans out when they see somebody having a bad day, they eat them like in wild. But the cool thing of all this is, man, like being able to now do some other stuff outside of the company that I was working for and being able to partake and be a part of so many amazing things and being able to do the narrative and, and working on stuff that I never would have been able to do. Um, not saying never would have been able to do, but at the time, in my life, I didn't do it because of being so busy. Yeah, and, and I mean, we, we, uh, there was so much of our endeavors together, to get, like being a top guy at WBE, we, we are, your, your balls are always tied, you know, type thing, you know, and like you had all this different ideas and energy, but now it's, now you're actually, that's why I opened this up, like Adam, you're free, you know what I mean? And like that was a big thing about the narrative was kind of your, uh, your launch party to your whole new life too, in a way, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wasn't, yeah, it was very unexpected, but <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's how life is. You, uh, things happen, everything happens for a reason. You know, one door closed and like, it's unbelievable how many more doors have opened and so many different opportunities. And you know, I turned down a lot of money like an astronomical amount of money to do this. Yes. Um, and thank you on camera, thank you for that. <laughs> like thank there's you. days when I freaking <laughs> think about it, and I'm like, holy shit. I mean, shit. I was sending you stuff like, bet on yourself, bet on yourself, bet on yourself. Like, no, I know, and that's <laughs> the thing, like, and that's, yeah, and it, and it is, and it's like, yeah, every, every three letter word yeah. corporation out there has made me an offer, mm -hmm. talked to me about what I want to do moving forward. And I said, first and foremost, I have something that I want to do. One was this. Two was just having a chance to breathe and live. Yeah. Like I said, unbelievably blessed for my time with WWE, but it was very, very time consuming. I went, in five years, I saw my parents like eight times. I missed people's funerals. I missed weddings. I missed births. I miss Christmases, I miss Thanksgivings. And those time, the time was amazing, don't get me wrong. But there was still, I'm still a human being. Yeah. And I have needs when it comes for comfort. 
and I, like I'm very close with my parents. I'm very close with my family and my big friends. Big shout out to the stuff. Crusher. Yeah. Big shout out to the Crusher. So it's not only yeah being able to like work with my friends on a project, being able to work on an app, being able to do all the other stuff that I have coming out very soon that I'll be able to talk about more, but just being able to live. And, and, you know, going back to my grassroots and, you know, this was one of the biggest things to come out of me working with you guys on the narrative was remembering who the fuck I was. I don't think uh, you had the chance as Braun Strowman to ever find... It wasn't uh, who, that. Who it is Adam Shearer as Braun no, Strowman? No, it wasn't even that. It's, it? no. it's not even that. It's just getting caught up in the bullshit. Yeah. Getting caught up in this so-called fame and stardom and everything that goes along with it and you're doing shit because everybody else is doing it and you feel like you need to fit in and you know I'm I'm in an industry where I don't really know what's going on. I don't know the ins and outs of it, so I'm just doing everything to try and belong. Mm -hmm. And so much of that stuff is not who I am and what made me who I am and got me to where I am and I lost sight of the stuff that really really mattered in life. And it made me sick to my stomach. I took out frustrations on people that cared about me, my family, my loved ones, my friends, and it was all because I was angry at myself and caught up in BS thinking that I needed to be somebody else or live this facade life and look at me and look at this and I have this and I got that and I did this. And when you come and realize it at the end of the day, oh, that's bullshit. Yes. None of it fucking matters. Nothing matters. It doesn't, because at the end of the day, we're all going to leave this earth, and it doesn't matter what you've acquired in your lifetime, monetary, materially, or whatever. It's about experiences and what you've done and how you've influenced other people. In my opinion, that's how I feel. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, I started turning into a literal monster, not because WWE made me a monster, because society made me a monster, because mm -hmm. Every second of my life still, I'm under a magnifying glass. Everywhere I go, I have to be on. Everything I type has to be proofread 500 times. Every time I think about opening my mouth, I have to think five times about it because everyone is looking for a reason to set you on fire. Mm -hmm. They would rather watch you crash and burn to the earth than soar with the eagles. And it's just... That's one of the biggest things that I got out of this and losing my job and, you know, and things that happened was just, it was a slap in the face that I needed as a person, as a human being. I needed this slap in the face to wake up and realize that I wasn't living life how I wanted to be. I wasn't living life how I was supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, my only agenda in life from here out is to leave the world a little bit better be it helping someone in, in need because they're having a bad day, stopping on the side of the road and, you know, helping somebody change a tire, you know, seeing somebody short for cash when they're trying to pay for their dinner or groceries, helping out. That's the things that really, really matter. It's, it's such a cliche thing, but it's in like Avengers, like it hits home with me, Thanos, when he says, I hope they remember you. And I want people to remember me as a good person. I want people to remember that Adam Scher, the guy who played Braun Strowman, the guy who did this, the guy who did that, deep down inside, he never changed from his roots. He's always been the humble little fat kid from Cheryl's Ford, North Carolina, that grew up into something I don't even know what it is yet. <laughs> That's the beauty is we're all still young. I um, guess. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm too young to feel this, this old. This is a good part of the amount of the narrative. We're all the same age, all yeah. of us. You know what I mean? Like I would have to say, 60% of the narrative. And if you watch a lot of what's on TV and being pushed in all the three little brands, everybody's between 38 and 42. You know what I mean? There was something in the water for Hulk Hogan and Macho Man and stuff, and it created a bunch of us. You know what I mean? It created a bunch of little monsters. Um, the one thing I do uh, want to ask you too. Um, we go into, uh, on your way into the, if you haven't seen it, he does go by the Amway and we have a little bit of self-reflection. Um, I would like to, like, what, at what point, in your, in especially in the last two years in WB, um, even as champion, at what point did you, you're like, I can't do this anymore? Like, uh, like you, you started, you actually, like, came, uh, like, a conscious to yourself. It just, it like, when you looked in the mirror, what, what point did you know? When I started hating myself mm -hmm. and, realizing that I wasn't happy. Um, 
You were the most unhappiest, unhappiest champion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well, it was just, and, and it all like a lot of it boils down to like just what I mentioned earlier about having to be on all the time and the criticism from the fucking fans. And it's that, and it's not even the fans. The fans aren't the ones. It's the it's the dorks on the internet that opinion and couch cushion book shows and do all this stuff and just nonstop talking shit about what we're trying to do. I didn't see any of you guys getting cast and thrown into the deep end of the pool, you know, in the middle of a pandemic when the whole world's in a frenzy, not knowing what's going on. I jumped on a jet and flew back. I had no idea that they were putting me over to beat Goldberg. I came back because people need an outlet. Mm -hmm. People need a way to check out from reality. And by me going to work and me being selfless and putting my health, my risk on the line, not knowing what's going on, I knew in the back of my mind that, yeah, I'm not going to make everybody happy. You can't make everybody happy. But there are people that's sitting at home. They're scared. They don't know what's going on in the world. And if I could take them out of that reality for three minutes while I'm out there wrestling, then I did my job. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. People watch wrestling to get caught up in it and forget about the bullshit that's going on in their lives. And having to listen and hear and read all this crap about this sucks and this blah, blah, blah. Like, I would love to see any of you get handed a fucking 1,500 word script on a piece of paper, get 15 minutes to 30 minutes to try and memorize it, then go out and do it on live television in front of no one. You can hear your heartbeat standing out there, and it was just, that's when it just got to the point where, man, like, I don't know, and I know that's part of what comes along with all this stuff, but just the nonstop negativity that there is in the wrestling community. It's toxic. It's It's so so toxic, toxic. and it made me hate, it made me hate going to work and hate this stuff, and I know I shouldn't read this stuff, I know I shouldn't care, but I do, because I care about my work, I care about what, how I'm projected, I want to be the best at everything I do, and it's a fault at times, but it's like the fact of like listening to these guys bury and just crap all over the match, the cinematic match that I had with Bray Wyatt. Say it's the worst match of the year, the worst thing they've ever seen, this, this, and this. If anybody, like you people, didn't have, people don't have a clue what went into doing that. I worked for 28 hours straight trying to get this out to our fans, get a product out to get people to take their mind off of what's going on in the world. I went to work the next day after filming it, wrestled on television. I got home that night at like 12 o'clock at night and was taking a shower and collapsed in my house. I had to have an ambulance come and get me from my house because I collapsed from dehydration. I went into full body cramps. They gave me, they double plumbed me on the way to the emergency room. I took four liters of fluid to get myself to stop cramping and to have to sit there and listen to people just criticize and naysay and it's just that's it made me hate everything not only like hate having to go to work it made me hate people in my life that cared about me it made me hate myself it sent me into this really really bad place and the only the only way I could ever get away from it was in the gym that's one of the reasons why I've worked so hard in the last year year and a half on training because it's one of the only things that I could control mm-hmm. so many things were out of my grasp, out of my fingertips. Gym is the only place I've ever truly found solace to being able to 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 do what I needed to do, you know, all the way back to the 13-year-old pudgy kid at Cheryl's Ford, North Carolina that went to Iron Physique in Denver, North Carolina and, and met a guy named Mike Kiever and, and, and asked him if he could help me what and show me the way. I didn't know how to lift weights. I didn't know how to eat. And because I was sick of being bullied. I was sick of getting picked on for being fat. And I figured that if I could get in shape and get muscles and stuff like that, that would be one way. And even then I was like, I'll get muscles and I'll just beat up these guys. And now <laughs> as an adult realizing that's not how it works. And it never did work that way. It just, I got into shape and then it just escalated and it turned into more and more and more. And the more I trained, the more things happened in my life. The more I trained, the bigger I got, stronger I got, more opportunities I got. And you know, without the gym, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have met you guys. I wouldn't have won countless titles and championships and strongman. I wouldn't have been a WWE superstar. Um, the gym and the iron and the steel that's in it is the only thing in my life that's really never lied to me. Um, 
it'll let you know when you're having a good day because it'll let you pick it up. It'll um, tell you when you're having a bad day because it won't. <laughs> I know, I need to go. Um, one last question. Uh, if you could fight anybody in the narrative, uh, who would it be? Hmm. You know, I, I don't know if it's really one person. I think it's anyone. I think it's mm -hmm. anyone that has something inside of them that they need to get out. Anybody that needs to be set free. These things have always been good at setting things free. Yeah, the, the Titans weapons. And then who would you like to see uh, knock on the door? <laughs> There's only one man on this earth right now that I want to see knock on that door. Uh, he's family. He showed me things in life that I never could have imagined seeing. He bestowed the gift upon me of being the godfather to his son. Wyndham, I'm waiting for you, brother. And that is Adam's reality. That was, that was heartfelt, it was touching, mm -hmm. it was emotional, it was true. Narrator, what did you feel having that conversation? Um, I mean, it was goosebumps the whole time. Uh, I think the hardest part on my end is not uh, busting into tears with Adam. I'm, I'm, I'm an empath, I can feel uh, people on an insane level, and he really wanted the opportunity to finally tell his story, not only in the ring and arrest, as a wrestler with us, but as a person. Um, and we, we touched on it in the, in the, in the interview, but it, you know, it was a very dark summer. Um, you know, but it wasn't ever, uh, we felt like, we never felt like wrestling producers. We felt like friends and therapists and trying to just help, r like, release the man that's inside, the titan that's inside, you know what I mean? And, uh, the you know, path to heaven, yeah. you yeah. have to go through hell. And yeah. uh, the thing about performers, I think Adam touched on, even at the top and the apex, there is the same anxieties, depressions, fears, apprehensions that every person faces today. Every person faces in general. Everyone has their journey, their narrative, their story to tell. And Adam telling his, I think, opened a lot of eyes because you see a man, you know, obviously stature, mm -hmm. big, physical, strong, proud, dare I say an alpha in mm -hmm. a sense, I'm more of a sigma. But <laughs> uh, he's able to, because I know it's near and dear to his heart, especially with what he's been through personally, and what a lot of us have from the performance aspect, and I'm sure a lot of you have, is uh, mental health and issues of that nature. And then feeling the constant you know, criticisms from others or the feelings that come with just being portrayed as one thing, but living, being, being able to truly live as yourself, it's hard. And I say this a lot, but art imitates life and as a performer, if you're completely controlled, you can't use your art to truly show your life. So mm -hmm. that's what we try to offer with uh, Free the Narrative Features, Control Your Narrative. Mm -hmm. When someone knocks on that door, uh, all have a chance to enter. And what we really want to do is facilitate people's real stories through our art, mm -hmm. our physicality, our entertainment our music, yeah. and, uh, and, and actually make it just fucking badass, <laughs> cool as shit, and dope and as fuck, as JC was said in uh, Suicide Squad. <laughs> and there was, you know, uh, when we say knocking on that door, uh, we look at the opportunity of conflict, not only as taking two polar personalities and seeing what happens, but the opportunity to, to bring out the best of each other in a fight. And sometimes it happens with complete There's contrast. It's something that happens when two people are, are very similar. If you take like a Weston Blake and John Scott, they were very s similar. But what they turned, what happened to themselves in the narrative was, was something completely different. Weston Blake's such a story that I can't wait to tell even mm -hmm. further and deeper. And I think we had a lot of performance and free the narrative, but there's no, it's no secret Adam and I are friends, but what we portrayed there is what happens when friends fight to better each other and themselves. And as you saw in his performance, and if you haven't, free the narrative, 
available now on Fight. Why aren't you watching it? Yeah. It's amazing. Don't sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> but when I fought him, the emotion and turmoil I saw him going through in his performance only brought out my own and my own apprehensions and hatred of the past because, you know, I was a... The speech I gave Jake Logan on Free the Narrative, watch it, it's mm -hmm. available now on Fight, is something I would have told my younger self yeah. about dreams and what they can do to you and how they can become nightmares. And it's true to an aspect. Of course, yeah. I'm very grateful and thankful for everything I've achieved and accomplished and it's wonderful and provided me quite a life. But when I'm fighting Adam and he's going through what he's going through, my disdain and hatred for people that got things handed to him mm -hmm. because of the right last name, because of their size, because of favorites and not even politics, but just who was at the right place at the right time. And there's no discernible skill or anything that separates. It was just who was chosen. Mm -hmm. And there's no way past that. Like that came out of me as I killed the monster because God damn, I've been waiting to kill one of fucking Vince's creations for so long. <laughs> and we, when you watch Free the Narrative, you actually, the narrator brings up like, to kill a monster, sometimes you need to become one. And it got, like, being in the ring on my end and, and trying to film it, it got scary. Like, it was, it was a harsh environment. And, and seeing uh, you actually become that, because you've worked heel, you've worked face, but you've never worked monster. You yeah. know what I mean? And that was one thing that was very uh, life-changing about watching those chair shots. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, bring in some positivity. Let's get, do a little bit of gratitude. Um, we want to a lot take of gratitude. A lot of yeah. gratitude. Uh, there's a lot of people that donated their time uh, to be, whether help create the narrative or be in the narrative. Um, you want to take it off, start off? Yeah, where do I start? I mean, who do I save for last? Do I save you or Adam for last? I'm gonna, let's start with Tommy Tanks. Tommy Tanks. Yeah. Uh, what I wrote on Instagram and on that blog I thought was tremendous. I don't have it on hand, but I believe it's something, the music he's created could tell these stories without a word spoken. Mm -hmm. He's donated so much time and effort. Phenomenal talent. What separates us, among many things, yeah. is truly our in-house music, how it captures moments and uh, emotion, and like I said, is cool as shit and dope <laughs> as fuck. So Tommy Tanks has really brought our production to a next level, something we can never imagine. And I've, we, were, we were in a, a pitch yesterday with uh, somebody. High like, level. High level in the Hollywood. Uh, oh, yeah. And I described it as, as the narrative is. Uh, it's Weinstein. <laughs> uh, I just <laughs> described it as uh, if David Fincher and Trent Reznor got together and uh, tried to make a wrestling product and that Tom, Tom and I. They try to make a wrestling yeah, product. They, they succeeded, succeeded it, yeah. well yeah, in making a wrestling product. And you, if you watch Free the Narrative, you will see that it is a feeling that um, there is a feeling of, of uh, foreboding and real. Foreboding and real. Wrote in the beginning. Yeah, and it is, and it is based on uh, what Tom was able to give to the audio treatment of this. Because it's not like we have him, as much as he's been writing theme songs for the wrestlers, he's also writing the score and giving you the, the aesthetic to your ears of how to feel. Do you remember how... Uh we pitched Tom EC3's new entrance music. Do you remember? Wasn't it a Westworld? It was. It was yeah. the cover of uh, Heart Shaped Box yeah. by uh, Regime Duat. I don't know the name, but <laughs> composer of Westworld. And I said, I want this somehow. And what we have is not that at all. It's better. It's better, yes. You know, and that's, that's the story behind the, the, the essential character and narrative theme song. Um, we, uh, we brought in a new, uh, he came in right after, in post-production of the first narrative, but this was the first time he was with us the whole time was Eric Knoll. Eric Knoll, yeah. a.k.a. Patch, yeah. a.k.a. the executioner, what I said about him yeah. is, uh, we'll tell his story very vividly. Yeah. We'll sit him down and We'll sit chair. him down and let him tell his own story, but, but he's... But, uh, he's survived so much in life. He's, he's had the ultimate fight, mm -hmm. and he won. Yes. And so now, I just want him to know that 
we never leave men behind, and he fights with us now. Yeah, and he and he's done a very good job of executing and patching up a lot of my work uh, as an so artist. Uh, we got him. You're, a, you're uh, like you're <laughs> a painter, dude, yeah. and he's you know an engineer. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's great. You, <laughs> he's <laughs> college educated in a program. You picked up for yeah. 250 bucks online. Um, yes. So uh, I last. Like, Did we, you notice how much how since he's gotten comfortable, he's emboldened now? Yeah. Yeah, he's totally emboldened. Yeah. Talking shit. Yeah, the kid's swearing. He, Flap, flapping his gums. Yeah. Making jokes. Cutting them on me. Yeah. <laughs> he's cutting jokes on you. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's getting pretty ballsy. I like that. <laughs> um, we'd also like to thank the cinematographer, Manuel. Um, Manny helped us along since the beginning of the narrative. and We had one idea and vision for when we released the very first essential character match, yeah. my debut, which we did, us, yeah. us, us, okay. Yeah. Well, promotion did this. We, we did. We did it. We did it. We did it. <laughs> but Manuel uh, fell into our laps in a happenstance away, just like all these mm -hmm. people involved with us do. It's very, it's really fucking surreal. But <laughs> we had one vision and he was able to execute it not knowing one thing about wrestling. Yes. So to but, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you. And... Our door is open. Our door is always open. Um, we'd love to create more with you. Uh, Matt Roby and Phil Kinney. The Willoughby Boys. Yeah. Yes. Our agents, I guess you can say. Yeah. I don't know why Phil had to wear the Fit Kitchen Jess shirt. He couldn't throw a narrative shirt on for the taping. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I get it. You're in love. That's fine. Yeah. Congrats on your engagement. But <laughs> what I said about them is no matter how far away we're from it, mm. having them there makes it always feel like home. Yes. So. Yeah, we've been creating with them. I mean, you have five more years on top of me creating with them. We've been 20 years with these guys. And I don't know if backyard wrestling is necessarily creating, but yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's, it's really... It, it is, actually. Yeah, it's nice terrible, to... Ter terrible creation. But. You know, people like Matt Roby, Phil Kinney, Tommy Tanks, they're all guys that we all grew up creating with, and now we get the opportunity to make something for the world with the narrative with, with old friends it's, and having that... There's, it's, it's so much easier because... How many friends you, the viewers, yeah. still have from your past that you create amazing things with, like you can call on at any moment? You shouldn't, mm -hmm. if you have them, talk to them, call mm -hmm. them. In fact, I'll provide that as a homework later. Yeah. But call them and just stay in touch because the people that you're close to want to hear from you and you want to hear from them. We all get busy, but like that... It's the truest bond, and I can't say more about it. Yeah, and to, one more name to throw on that list was Steve Rockhorst. Uh, he's the singer of Mushroom Head. He's the uh, singer on the Monster and Us All theme song that you hear in the opening. Um, it's available on all streaming uh, platforms right now. But Steve was one of those guys that we, we sent him the song and the lyrics, and like, we're like, hey, we need this in 24 hours. And he got it over to us, and, it's, and he's such a gifted and blessed singer. And we, uh, we Is hope he the to one that doesn't sleep? Yeah, Steve doesn't sleep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Or he does. He does his day. Yeah, vampire, it's just, yeah, he's vampire a, hours. Yeah, he's a vampire and yeah, he's making music all night in, in, his, in his laboratory. Um, Sarah Johnson, my girlfriend, uh, she's the foundation that holds us together. We really appreciate everything. Truly. You have done as an a associate producer and as a business manager at Justified. If you look closely at Free the Narrative 2, which you should because <laughs> yeah. it's awesome, yeah. and the original. Uh, it's it's always match, but it's her, her she, and Phil. Yeah, <laughs> she's sitting there like a queen. Yeah, she's the queen of the underground, sitting next to Adam's best friend Phil, uh, who's the king of the underground in and our he eyes. Looks yeah. Exactly like Conrad Thompson. Yeah, which we will get to in a future narrative. Wink, wink. Um, who else we need to thank? Everybody. Uh, everybody. Each um, and every talent. I mean. Each and every. Let's let, name uh, off a talent. I'll say something nice about. Yeah, it. William Bill Carr. William, one of my. Truest mates, uh, what I said about him was that one day, and this is a story he will tell us later, but mm -hmm. one day when you're on an airplane, a airplane, <laughs> when you're on an airplane and there's tears coming down your face and the person next to you taps you on the shoulder and asks you, are you okay? And you say, I miss my friend. I hope it's about me and not about the person who when you tell that story, the person thought it was. Yeah. Okay, next. Um, Matt Seidel. Matt Seidel, the vision. Yes. He loved the idea. And he was, <laughs> we called on him in an instant to do Free the Narrative 1, yeah. where I thought, 
Matt Cardona, which you should watch. It's yeah. awesome. And but uh, he's very like minded. He's yeah. an energetic spirit. Great with breath work, but just a, a third yeah. eye, a blessing to have. One of the coolest guys you'll ever meet, and just such a positive person that we're so thankful he was able to jump in, pinch hit for us, yeah. and then we can't wait to do more with him yeah. when that time he comes. He came in like a, like, he literally moved like a vision, and that's what we call he him. Did. The, yeah. Um, how about fodder? Fodder. Well, what, what a big part of our, another, our office. Yeah, yeah. Another happenstantial meet I've had yeah. where uh, I think I was conversing with some nameless figure on Instagram about supplements because I was like, hey, can I take this because I have this drug test? And the answer was yes because I'm not on drugs. <laughs> but uh, it, we just started talking. He's like, hey, man, I don't, you know, I'm a wrestler. Or I'm trying to be one. And he just started like you are, and this guy has so much other successful things going on with his his yeah. business, his real life, where I'm like, well, why? You're doing really <laughs> yeah. good, you don't need this. He's like, nah, man, it's just something I always wanted to try. But then that brought us closer when I called on him to be my opponent in the very first initial narrative match. Uh, he's like, I'll be there. And he mm -hmm. just saw an opportunity and for up and coming talent, know that your opportunities may come in weird and strange ways. And it might come from a DM from EC3 to say, hey, can you be in Orlando in a week? Yeah. Because you look like the perfect person whose ass I could kick. Because <laughs> when I, we shouted originally, I wanted somebody that wasn't known, but you know could kick somebody's ass. Somebody yeah. that looks like he's in a fight. Not a guy in his like, singlet or like baggy pants and you know rolled out of bed. Like I wanted somebody that looks like a proficient fighter and a killer and I showed this picture to narrator here and he says oh he's got Mount Rushmore tattooed on his stomach I want to punch him in the face yeah something like that so we become great friends yeah he's super helpful with uh, social media and our websites and things like that the like, things that I don't have he, time for he don't even know. jump yeah he wants more to do <laughs> And we just don't even know where to start. So yeah. if you get an email blast, read it because uh, he sent it to you. And then uh, you're very thankful for him. The gatekeeper of hell, Pero. Pero. I'll always remember this. And he was absolutely right when I had apprehensions about, like, what are, what are we trying to accomplish? What are we going to do? How is this going to become a thing? Is it even worth pursuing? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But I need a reassurance. And he said, no matter what happens, it'll always take two. Mm -hmm. And two improved on our ideas and formats so much that I thank him for that push and that yeah. belief, believing in us, believing in the ability to. He's, ring, he's also the reason we had a ring rental. Oh yeah, that yeah, helps. He, he made sure we had a ring. Like <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the ability we're gonna be able to tell. He wanted to tell his story, and his story is very unique. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of. Uh, he fights against stereotypes yes. for who he is and who he loves. And he wants to change that. And I'm like, well, no better way than here. No yes. better place, no better time than now. So him, for all he does, thank you. And, and right into uh, one of his uh, partners is Jared from No Peace Underground and Soundbar. Thank you for everything that you yeah. helped us with. Like he's in there as associate producer, but he really made sure that the, the second narrative was gonna be success. He made sure that the staff was on point. Like he, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And we hope to do so much more with Jared and the sound bar and No Peace Underground. Yeah, he made sure the bartender can <laughs> give L to my men after the show. So Which was very nice. Um, Jake Logan, who we have still a story to Jake tell Logan, with. Jake Logan, what a story to tell. Yeah. And it's up to him to tell it now. Yeah. But when, uh, we were in a pandemic and things kind of picked up fakely for a minute. I went to a show in Texas and the promoter kind of said, oh, this guy's on your flight, whatever. But he's, he was young, he's hungry. He picked my brain and he caught me in a shockingly good mood. But the one thing I will always do for anybody who asks, if they ask with true sincerity and show effort Upon what they ask is I will help them in any way I can. I will give you blunt honesty. I will give you critiques. I will give you diet advice. I will give you workout. If you just ask, 
I'm more inclined to probably do it. And there's a lot of people that could probably speak to that. But the thing is, when I do it, you have to do it. If you don't do it, I fucking go away. Don't waste my time because a lot of people have and I don't understand that. Hey, I want to do this and this. Well, I think this and this and this would work. Okay, I'm going to keep doing the exact same things or yeah. the opposite. All right, well, whatever. That's your choice. That's your narrative. Fine. But Jake, he does want it. Does he want it for the right reasons? I still don't know. Does he want the right things? I still don't know. That's his story. He's going to have yeah. to tell us. But... uh I don't know. I like having space monkeys I can yeah. <laughs> throw into space and experiment uh, I, with. So uh, I, you know, John Scaller and Weston Blake, you know, kind of th- thank them Dude. both together, but really want to thank Weston Blake. He's been not only so proficient in the ring and showing us the real Wes- Weston Blake, but he's been coming in to justified and helping us too. Yeah, and he's, it's, you know, ass. he's been kicking ass on every level. Um, For a guy that beats the hell out of people so convincingly. <laughs> What a sweetheart. Yeah, what a sweetheart. No, but like <laughs> Blake, I think I've said this multiple times, but I'll say it any time I can, yeah. because you never know who's watching something for the first time, is absolutely easily, you ask any person that's ever been in a wrestling ring with him, they will say, hey, who's, who's the best opponent you've had? Blake. Mm-hmm. It's always Blake, because he's so good, and his story is so unique, because if you're so good at something, how could you not be doing it? <laughs> like, there's, you probably, you probably all, you're on the internet, you probably all have your favorites and you're not wrong. There's no wrong or right in this. Yeah. But I'll tell you from people that have been inside the ring, like if a musician's like, hey, yeah. hey, who's your favorite guitarist? And he names somebody from a band he never heard of. Yep. You might be like, oh, really? But then if you know music, you were like, holy shit, like this guy, like what you, the drummer from Dave Matthews or something yeah, yeah. the other day. But you don't so, listen to Dave Matthews, but I know the drummer's one of the best drummers around. Yeah. And Weston Blake is that best wrestler that, no, that I guess like only the, the, the inner circle kind of know, you know what I mean, of the wrestling industry, the ones that have been in the ring with him. Because he didn't have the opportunity of being able to wrestle for more than a few minutes on TV a lot of the time. But like, anytime he was on NXT, we'd do a live event. He's out there 20 minutes yeah. tearing the house down. Any chance he get, he'd be in practice having fucking bangers. I'm like, <laughs> How is this possible? I can barely walk. But no, he's so incredible. And Skyler's in kind of the same mold. He came yeah. into the first narrative. I've seen him a few times through Independence, and we kind of came together through happenstance again, strangely, yeah. in a secret Illuminati-like text group involving some of the highest level professional wrestling names that would shock you. But uh, asking him to do this, I know his story is very much the same without having the NXT or WWE as a launching ground like Blake did. So he was doing it on the indies for so long, he suffered a catastrophic knee injury, which I have had the same thing happen to me. He was coming back. How do you get yourself back on the scene, on the radar? Um, we were fortunate enough to hopefully put him on that path. And then months later, he has a job with Impact. He's killing it there. He comes mm-hmm. back, kills it with us. Uh, I can't thank anybody enough for putting that kind of faith in us. Matt Taven. Matt Taven, another pinch hitter who yeah. came in and hit a grand slam. But Taven's a guy I became close with in Ring of Honor. We're very like-minded in like business aspects of wrestling. Things of that nature were very like-minded in a lot of things, yes. right, Matt? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean. But uh, he gave us the opportunity to tell a story about the color purple. Yeah, like <laughs> with William, we'll talk about his curse at another time. But his there was about six or seven pretty high-level names that were tossed around for him. But Taven was just coming up to watch. You mm-hmm. know, like you think you you want to be in it. He was, he was maybe kind of skeptical. He saw bits of the first, yeah. and he trusts me, but he's still like, I don't. what am I walking into? But when he walked in and saw the, the place, he's like, I want to do this. Yeah. And then he went above and beyond, because after we filmed his fight, he still wanted, I'm still hanging out. I'm going to go on this crazy walk with you guys. Yeah. Like he bought in. He's yeah, he's in the opening walk. He just uh, he looks more like Assassin's Creed out like there. Ghost. But then yeah. what I really liked about working with Matt is that I know he loves the color purple. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. So I ask him why. 
He tells me a few things, and that gave us enough bullets in the chamber to tell a mm -hmm. story about purple in a wrestling match. So yeah, go watch I, something free the narrative too. Yeah. Like you, don't, you like it's it's pretty amazing. Maybe one day I'll get into my tenets of professional wrestling, but <laughs> one of them is you can find a story in anything, mm -hmm. and we found a story in the color purple, and it worked. The King of Death match, Matt Cardona. The ultimate gratitude. The only reason I'm paying gratitude is because of that, because he instilled mm -hmm. that in me. The purpose of bringing in Matt and the original one was we are polarities in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like we're totally different, but at the same time, we're kind of linked and very much alike. So having him lend his talent, his skill, and his name value to the first one was incredible. Like yes. gift because he didn't have to do that. He was like, "Man, nah, I'm good. I'll just work for Impact and cash all these indie checks. And yeah, play and with my toys." And, and he's like, consistently date excited. My hot fiance. Yeah. Like he, his, yeah. he's gonna, like like his support. Like he couldn't make the last one because of scheduling. But like, was he still a cheerleader on the sides on the sidelines? Absolutely, and still checking in and and what can I do? What can I do? And he's never one that that asks for anything. It's always what can I do to help make this project alive and real and Cardona was probably what was amazing is when if you could see on YouTube with uh, his entrance and us driving around in the Ghostbusters my first time was just me and him talking and he told me that my uh, my visions and my ideas are are super crazy but he was so intrigued by you know half the stuff that comes out of my head that he was really excited about what would would it come of it? And he just sent me a text the other day about his memorial and saying like, you know, I love this. And here we are months later, it's already been out. And he just, he's, he, he's one of those guys that the nostalgia for him is comes in ways. And he, he tends to like just enjoy things over and over and over again. And not many people do that in their upper thirties anymore. He's a, he's a child at heart, but yeah. his love and passion for creating and entertaining and wrestling, not only mm -hmm. wrestling, but everything he's bringing to the table, like, yeah. He, he truly loves it and as filled with venom and rage I am <laughs> in the world gone mad, I respect that. Yeah, we respect Matt Cardona. Um, before we end this, uh, there's going to be a video at the end of this, a little teaser from Free the Narrative 2, uh, where we have a good friend of Adam and ours, Jared Violinist. He's six foot five, handsome, Thor looking. Hunk. Hunk. Drunk. But he, uh, he plays the role of, I don't know, kind of death in, in Adam, uh, Adam's in purgatory before he comes to the narrative. And he's having a reflection about, you know, the hands that he's been given. And uh, Jared is just standing over him like death. And he's playing a very familiar theme song, if you're a fan of Adam's career. And it just gave it an element that, you know, and if you've seen the bar scene between him and Adam, it's in the background and stuff. But he added this element of like, something really depressing but creepy and intriguing is happening with his uh his performance so um anything else you want to say for the, to top this off at yeah, the end i mean yeah. if we're going to establish this as a weekly thing we've got to start yeah. establishing weekly yeah so like and subscribe rules. <laughs> yeah. oh yeah right you're still yeah. there are you still even watching yeah if you're listening like, subscribe listen yeah follow all that oh, stuff man, please i hate that shit yeah but you just say it from now on yeah so i don't have to <laughs> but i want to yeah in the narrative, it's about control, freedom, purpose. Finding mm -hmm. purpose sometimes come through challenging yourself to do different things. So everything I tell you to do, I've done it, uh, but I will give you homework. Yes. Now, if you choose to do your homework, you can send a me a message. You can send the control your narrative Instagram account a message. Can they message you on YouTube? I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, comment. You can yeah, comment. comment. Yeah. If you did the homework, yeah. just bring me attention. Yeah, comment right here. Yeah. You're more, if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment your homework. But the homework for this week, or you can you can do it and not tell anybody. That's cool, yeah. too. You don't yeah. got to post everything on social media. Yeah. This is about no your change in yourself. But like yeah. I said when I was talking about friends from back home, give somebody a phone call you haven't talked to in a while for no other reason than just to connect and shoot the breeze. Just mm -hmm. talk. Any time I've done that randomly, and any time it's been done to me, well, first off, I'm like, who the fuck is calling me? God, <laughs> well, that's weird. Is somebody dead? No, but then we end up talking for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, 
and just yeah. a endorphins release, feeling, emotion, love for friends, so family, what it, whatever it may be. So give somebody a call. Your godmother, yeah. your, your, your aunt, your stepbrother, your f first crush, if you still talk. I mean, that might be weird. It might be weird. Give somebody a call. Uh, once again, like, subscribe, uh, follow this. We'll be, our, our goal is to be live every Wednesday with Control Your Nerve Weekly. Um, our goal is to, these are goals, not guarantees. Our goal is to have a audio version of this on your streaming platforms by Friday. We're gonna do our best uh, to bring this into existence, speak this into existence over the next couple of weeks. Um, and with that being said, I hope to have an interview with Marina Shafir next week, who we've, be, we, who oh is, oh my God, yeah, what a piece of work. Yeah. The work you made. I mean, yeah. she's a great person. Like, what a piece of work. Like, oh, yeah. No, she's a wonderful human being. And, and she's going to be the first woman in the narrative. And if you it's watch not a sausage it. sausage fest anymore, boys. Yeah, and uh, what a, I'm just getting goosebumps at the, the possibilities with Marina Shafir in, in the sense of an assassin is going to be very, very intriguing going into the future narratives. Uh, so with that being said, anything less as we go into this video of, of a little teaser for you there too with Adam? Just like to say, Jared, take us home, and you've been warned. See you next week. These hands were created by another, not in the likeliness of the creator, but the darkest part of his mind. But monsters develop emotion, attachment, feelings.